Welcome to our reading on understanding cash flow statements with me, John Bone. Now, cash flow statements, one of the trickiest areas within financial reporting analysis. And of course, financial reporting analysis is probably one of the trickier areas in the level one syllabus. So this one is going to take a bit of work. It's going to take crunching as many questions as you can to really master this area. OK, we start off relatively simple, though, talking about uh, comparing the three classifications of the cash flow statement. So that's CFO, CFI, CFF, and we'll talk about those. And then being able to classify items into one of those three uh, classifications. OK, well, we know that net income is not the same as cash, and we know the reason why. It's because of the accruals process, because we account for revenues when they're earned, not when customers are, pay are paying us. And the accruals process for our expenses, we uh, essentially it, it report the expense in the income statement when it's incurred, again, not when it's uh, paid. And of course, the matching concept, we buy an asset, but if it's going to generate revenues over a number of years, it's stored in the balance sheet and then expensed via depreciation or amortization into the income statement. So therefore, net income is not the same as cash. And as we may have said before, companies don't go bankrupt because of a lack of profit. They go bankrupt because of a loss of a lack of cash, i.e. the inability to pay liabilities when they fall due. So the cash flow statement is going to be very important. It's going to show us how we generated cash. It's going to show us how we use cash during the year. Remember, the cash flow statement essentially is a reconciliation. It takes last year's cash in the balance sheet, this year's cash in the balance sheet, and explains the change. Now, the cash flow statement has three components under both IFRS and US GAAP. They are cash flow from operations, otherwise known as operating cash flows. And these are the cash that we de generate from our day-to-day -day business activities, our core trading activities. Cash flow from investing. So this is typically the cash that we spend uh, buying our infrastructure, PP&E, other uh, subsidiary companies, and any cash raised when we dispose and cash flow from financing, which is to do with our capital structure, our blend of debt and equity. So let's start off with our cash flow from operations. This is just a, a, an indication of the kind of stuff that you're likely to see here. Uh, and this is actually being produced under what's called the direct method that we're going to discuss later on. So we've got the cash received from our customers. Notice it's not sales, it's the actual cash that we collected from our customers. Any cash dividends received will go through CFO. Any cash interest received will go through CFO, plus any other incidental uh, cash income. Maybe we rent out one of our properties because we're not using it, and we're receiving some incidental non-operating income, and this would be the cash uh, that is received by the company. We've then got all of our payments, payments to our suppliers. Again, not the purchases, uh, not the cost of goods sold, but this is the actual cash that we've paid our suppliers. Any cash expenses, wages paid, rents paid, rates paid, etc. Cash interest paid goes through here as well. And then our cash taxes paid, so the actual cash flows paid to the tax authorities. Now notice when we look at this, and this is prepared under US GAAP, I should state. When we look at this, we can see dividends received, interest received, and also uh, interest paid. What we're not seeing, though, is dividends paid. Rather strange idea, this, but under US GAAP, dividends paid are going to be treated as a cash flow from financing. Seems strange to me, because we've got interest paid in the CFO, but dividends paid in the CFF under US GAAP. And both of them, in my mind, are payments or distributions to the providers of capital, but they're appearing in very different parts of the cash flow statement. So just be aware of that peculiarity and be aware that dividends paid are not in CFO under US GAAP. So here's our investing cash flows. As we said, it's all the cash that we raise when we're buying infrastructure and other companies, uh, and or cash we spend, I should say, when we're buying infrastructure and other companies, um, less any cash that we raise when we dispose of these items. So it's the cash spent purchasing property, plant, and equipment, the cash spent buying intangibles, any proceeds we receive when we dispose of any assets, and any um, cash that we spend buying equity for group companies. So it could be the cash we spend investing in joint ventures and affiliates. Now, remember the other name for affiliate being associate. So these are companies where we have influence but not control. Payments for businesses acquired. These are our subsidiaries. So actually purchasing subsidiaries. And we've got the purchase and sale of intangibles as well. 
Notice as well, it includes the purchases and sale of marketable securities. But then right underneath that, we said it excludes trading securities. Remember our three classifications? We've got held to maturity, available for sale, and trading as our marketable securities. So what we're saying is uh, held to maturity and available for sale would go through cash flow from investing, but trading securities, purchases and sales of those, wouldn't. It would go through CFO. Now, the reason behind that is if you've got trading securities, buying selling securities is going to be part of your core business operations. In other words, you're an investment fund, essentially. And therefore, this is part of your day-to-day -day business operations and should be treated as a cash flow from operations, not a cash flow from investing. So that's why trading securities would be treated as CFO. Notice as well, we exclude cash equivalents. These are our short-term money market instruments. They are treated as part of cash itself, not as a, a reconciliation between opening and closing cash. So they're going to be treated as part of balance sheet cash. And our cash flow from financing. So this is to do with our capital structure. So every time we issue more stock, we issue a bond and cash comes in. Every time we pay off principal, not interest under US GAAP on debt, remember, the interest we saw passing through cash flow from operations. But the principal payments as we pay off debt uh, they are going to pass through cash flow from financing. So it's the issue, repurchase and redemption of common stock, preferred stock and debt instruments are going to pass through CFF. Dividend payments, of course, remember under US GAAP also pass through cash flow from financing, not cash flow from uh, operation. And again, remember that's very strange. Interest paid is going to go through CFO under US GAAP. Dividends paid are not. Likewise, dividends received are passing through cash flow from operations, but dividend payments are not under US GAAP. Remember, US GAAP is a far more rules-based uh, approach than uh, IFRS, which is more, far more principle-based. We've also said it excludes indirect financing. One method of indirect financing is simply to delay payment to your suppliers. Now, if you delay payment to your suppliers, your accounts payable, of course, will increase. And that's actually going to affect CFO rather than CFF. And we'll see the mechanics of why that will be the case a little later. Our next little LOS here asks us to be, be able to describe non-cash investing and financing activities. So in other words, the company may have some transactions that don't result in cash flows. Now, they're going to be disclosed in the footnotes, but by, by, by their definition, if they don't involve the payment or receipt of cash, they're not going to appear in the cash flow statement. So again, I think all you need here is just an awareness of the kind of transactions we're looking at. So the first one, we've got converting debt or preferred into common equity. So we're talking about convertible securities, convertible bonds, convertible preferred stock. If they're converted into equity, then obviously there's a change to our common stock, but no cash flow is received by the company. Again, of course, another thing that you could link in there is, the, uh, is bonus issues, uh, essentially, where free shares are issued. Stockholders' equity will change, but no cash is received by the company. Assets acquired under capital leases. When you lease in an asset, of course, uh, the asset's going to increase in the balance sheet, but there's no physical payment up front. The only payments we're going to see are rental payments, essentially. Purchase of assets via issue of debt and equity. So rather than paying cash, we've essentially issued a bond in place of that or issued or given equity away in order uh, as consideration for the asset. Exchange, part exchange, exchanging one asset for another. Barter transactions, part exchange transactions. Again, no cash flows involved. And there's that last one we mentioned, stock dividends or bonus issues, where the company is giving away free shares, essentially. No cash flow involved. So just be a little bit aware of your non-cash items and the fact that they, by definition, do not affect uh, the cash flow statement, but would be disclosed in the footnotes. Now, our next LOS is asking us to contrast US GAAP via, uh, versus IFRS. What you straight away notice is US GAAP is very prescriptive. It's a rules-based system or an objective. It's kind of split between rules-based and principles-based these days, an objective-based system. IFRS, remember, is far more principle-based. So when we look at interest received and interest paid, US GAAP tells us the rule, put it through CFO. Dividends received, US GAAP says CFO. Remember, the quirk under US GAAP 
dividends paid are not going to go through CFO, they're going to pass through CFF. All of your tax paid, no matter how it arises, whether it arises on your your day-to-day -day profitability or whether it arises due to the disposal of assets, etc., all passes through CFO under US GAAP. And bank overdrafts, so if you're overdrawn, that is treated as a, a debt instrument in its own right under US GAAP and is treated as an element of CFF. Now let's turn our attention to IFRS. Now remember, IFRS typically more concerned with economic substance or the ability to report economic substance than rules. So when you look at interest received, it says it could be CFO, it could be CFI. What you've got to do here is look at the nature of the company. Is receiving interest part of your core business operations, your day-to-day -day activities? If you're a bank, the answer is probably yes, in which case interest received would pass through CFO. If receiving interest is rather incidental to your core operations, then it would pass through CFI. Same with interest paid. Is paying interest part of your core business operations? Yes, if you're a bank, put it through CFO. If it's not, if it's more linked to just the capital structure and how you finance your business operations, it would pass through CFF. The same with dividends. Is receiving dividends part of your core operations? Answer, yes, put it through CFO. If it's incidental, it's if it's non-operating, if you like, pass it through CFI. Same with dividends paid, CFO or CFF. You've got a split. Is it part of your core operations or not? And notice with taxes paid, we can split between the three classifications. In other words, the tax on our day-to-day -day trading activities would pass through CFO. Any taxes resulting from the, the purchase and sale of assets would potentially pass through CFI. And any tax resulting from the, uh, maybe the early redemption of debt or uh, buybacks, etc., of equity would pass through CFF. Bank overdrafts, bank overdrafts under IFRS are not deemed to be a debt instrument in their own right. They're deemed to be part of cash. In other words, they're included in the figures that we're reconciling between the cash and cash equivalents. Now, our next LOS asks us to distinguish and describe the direct and indirect methods of calculating cash flow from operations. And we've got to describe arguments in favor of each method. Now, when you look at the accounting standards, both uh, US GAAP and IFRS say that the direct method is preferred. And it's preferred because it gives far more information to the analyst. We can see each item of cash, how CFO is composed, what cash came from your customers, what cash was paid to suppliers, etc. So there's far more information about how CFO is comprised of. The indirect method is really a shortcut to the direct method. What we're going to do is take net income and just strip out all the non-cash items. Now, it's a much quicker and easier approach to take, and therefore a lot of companies actually choose the indirect method when actually the accounting standards say the direct method is preferred. But again, they give companies a choice. But with the indirect method, we're losing a lot of the detailed information about how cash flows were generated. And therefore, it's going to be the analyst's role, if you like, to reconstruct the direct method if a company has used an indirect method. And we're going to see that later as well. So the direct method is identifying actual cash inflows and outflows by each source. How much was collected from customers, how much was paid to suppliers, how much was paid to employees, etc. The indirect method, taking net income, stripping out the non-cash items within it. Now our next LOS says describe the linkage between the cash flow statement and the balance sheet and income statement. And we're going to do this via a T account. Now we talked very briefly about T accounts at the beginning of financial reporting analysis. We said all the double entry transactions, the debits and credits, are recorded in the, in the journals. Then at the year end, they're all processed into the T accounts to summarize that information. We've got a T account for our accounts receivable here. So let's have a look. What are you going to see? You're going to see the amount brought forward. This is simply last year's balance sheet figure. And there it is, 18,000. We're also going to see the amount carried forward, the amount appearing in this year's balance sheet, 20,000. Now, if we take the amount in the income statement for sales, 200,000, we should therefore be able to deduce what cash was received from our customers. 
Now again, we're simplifying this. We haven't got any uh, customers that have paid us before the uh, earnings activity is complete, any deferred revenue, unearned revenue. We haven't got any uh, bad debt provisions in this stuff, just to keep it nice and simple. Now notice, of course, if we had a brought forward amount of 18,000 and sold $200,000 of goods on credit, our amount carried forward, if we'd collected no cash from our customers, should have been 218,000. But it's not when we look at this. It's only 20,000. So the missing figure must be 198,000, and that must represent the cash that we've received from our customers. So by taking balance sheet data and income statement data, we can derive the values for our cash flow statement. <clears throat> now there is a slightly quicker way of actually doing this. If we take our sales figure, 200,000, and we look at the change in the balance sheet amount, 18,000 at the beginning of the year, 20,000 at the start of the year, so we've got a $2,000 change. If we apply the rule, increase in an asset deduct, decrease in an asset add, and we're gonna see that rule again a little bit later, so our change in accounts receivable, we've got an increase of 2,000, we'll deduct it, and notice that jumps us straight to the cash figure of 198,000. So notice that little calculation I did is really shortcutting the need to produce T accounts in order to generate the cash flow statement. And that's gonna have a direct implication when we look at the direct method. We'll be using essentially this approach rather than T accounts when we look at the direct approach to computing CFO. So describe cash inflows and outflows. As we said, an increase in an asset represents an outflow of cash. And we saw that in our last example. We had an increase in an accounts receivable. We deducted it from the sales figure to get the cash received from our customers. So assets, if assets have increased, that's deemed to be a cash outflow. If assets have decreased, well, normally when your assets decrease, that's because either customers are paying you or you're selling off assets. So your cash flows essentially are an inflow. With liabilities and equity, if they increase, it's an outflow. Let's take our accounts payable. If that suddenly increase, increases, it, it's because we're delaying payment, or it could be because we're de delaying payment to our suppliers, in which case less cash is leaving the business, so it's treated as an inflow. If liabilities suddenly drop, well, of course, if we're paying off our liabilities, cash is leaving the business. Remember, when we extinguish a liability, it's an outflow of economic benefit, and therefore liabilities uh, an equity decreasing would be an outflow. Okay, so we're going to use those approaches when we do both the indirect and the direct cash flow statement approach in just a little while. So let's have a little look here at an, a big example of this. Notice our LOS is described, but we need to be able to understand the mechanics behind this. So we've got Ecclestone Industries here, and it's got the following income statement for 20x9 and we've been given the balance sheets for 20x8 and 20x9. So we've got two years of balance sheet, we've got the income statement, and we're gonna construct the cash flows using the indirect method. Bit of additional information there. We've been told in this uh, example, equipment was purchased for $50,000. Now, when we look at CFO under the indirect method, our cash flow from operations are going to be equal to our net income plus our non-cash charges minus the change in working capital. Okay, so what we're doing with these two elements is we're stripping out any non-cash element from net income. If you like, what we're doing with the indirect method is we're stripping out the impact of the accruals process on our net income. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Okay, so let's have a look at the income statement. When we look at Ecclestone, there's the sales. We can see our cost of goods sold, 80,000. Salaries, 10,000. Ooh, depreciation. Now depreciation, of course, is a classic non-cash charge relating to our property, plant, and equipment. It's not cash. Cash is when you buy the equipment. Cash is when you dispose of the equipment. Depreciation is spreading the cost of the asset over its useful life into the income statement. It's not a cash flow. Uh, therefore, it's a classic non-cash charge. The other obvious non-cash charge I can see when I look down here is the gain 
on sale of PP&E. Now, a lot of people get confused. Why is this not a cash flow? We'll talk about why it's not a cash flow in just a little while. But number one, it's not a cash flow. And number two, even if it was a cash flow, it would be a cash flow from investing, not a cash flow from operations. So gains from sale of PP&E, any gain or loss on the early retirement of debt, you're going to need to eliminate. So we've got some certain, certainly some non-cash charges that leap out on the face of our income statement, but we know as well a lot of these items will be affected by the accruals process. In other words, sales is not the same as the cash collected from customers. We're going to need to make adjustment. Cost of goods sold is not the same as the cash paid to suppliers. We're going to need to adjust. So each other item we're going to need to adjust, and these are our working capital adjustments that we talked about. So let's have a look at our balance sheet. You can see your current assets, uh, X8, X9. Now be very careful with your balance sheet data. Notice we've got the oldest year first and the most recent year second. Now there is nothing in any of the accounting standards that says which year needs to be shown first. All the accounting standards say is you need to show comparative data. We're often used to seeing the most recent year shown as the first column. And therefore, I think people take that into the exam and assume that's going to be the case and don't check. But it's going to be very important because we're going to need to look at the change in these items. In other words, when we look at our accounts receivable, for example, it was 18, it's gone up to 20,000. That's a $2,000 increase. Now, if you haven't spotted that they've given you the oldest year first, you'd look at that and think that's a $2,000 decrease rather than increase and suddenly you start to unravel in the exam. So just be a bit careful when you look at balance sheet data there. So we've got accounts receivable. We've got some inventory in there as well. Remember cash, this cash figure up here, that's what we're reconciling between. That's what the cash flow is going to do, or the cash flow statement is going to do. It's going to explain to us why if cash was 66,000 at the end of the year and 18,000 at the beginning of the year, it's going to explain where that 48,000 of cash was generated and spent. So it's reconciling the change in cash and cash equivalents. Okay, we've been given our gross PP and E and accumulated depreciation separately. Uh, it can be shown separately like this, um, or it could be shown net. So they can actually show on the face of the balance sheet just gross PP and E, net of accumulated depreciation, in which case in 20X8 would be seeing a figure of 202 and in 20x9 312 less 84 that would be a figure of 228 so be aware they don't need to be shown separately gross pp e simply means the cost of our pp e accumulated to depreciation remember is a running total of the depreciation that's hit our income statement so far over the assets life and there are our total assets Let's turn our attention to the other side of the balance sheet, the liabilities and the equity. Here are our current liabilities. We've got accounts payable, salaries payable, interest payable, taxes payable, and dividends payable in this particular example. Uh, Non-current liabilities, we've got bonds, and we've got this dreaded word, deferred taxes. Now, deferred taxes, or the change in deferred taxes is going to be what we call a non-cash item and it's going to need to be adjusted for. If you know that a change in deferred tax is a non-cash item, you are going to be well ahead of most people in that exam. Most people will not spot and will not adjust this. Okay, and that takes us down to uh, our total liabilities and equity of 525 and 324. So we're going to start by looking at the indirect method. Now this we start with net income. We're then going to adjust our net income for changes in relevant balance sheet items. So again, a set of rules to remember. Increase in an asset, deduct. It's a, essentially uh, an outflow. Increase in a liability, add. It's an inflow. Decrease in an asset, add. It's an inflow. And decrease in a liability, deduct. It's an outflow. So a mechanical set of rules. We're going to use these rules, first of all, with the indirect method, but then with the direct method as well. Now, with depreciation, amortization, of course, they need to be eliminated by being added back. Why? They've been deducted in arriving at net income, but they're not cash items. So any of our non-cash charges, depreciation, amortization, those are going to have to be added back. Also, we're going to need to eliminate gains and losses on asset disposals, early retirement of debt as well. Why? They're non-cash items. Now, again, with an asset disposal, number one, we said it's not 
not cash. And number two, we said it wouldn't be a cash flow from operations anyway, it'd be a cash flow from investing. Same issue with debt, any gains or losses on the early retirement of debt. Number one, it's not cash. And number two, even if it was, it would be a cash flow from financing, not a cash flow from operations. Now, if we've got a, a gain, we're going to need to deduct it. It's been added in, uh, to net income in arriving at a net income, so we now need to deduct it to remove it. It's not a cash flow. If we've got a loss, it's been deducted in arriving at net income, so we would need to add it back in order to remove it. So let's have a look at our approach using the, the data for Eccleston Industries, using the balance sheet and income statement. So our first thing that we're going to do is add back our non-cash charges. So the first one always to be on the guard for is depreciation. It's going to appear in every single question. Every company has depreciation. Again, if you saw amortization in a question, that also would need to be added back. So we're adding it back, remember, because it's been deducted in arriving in, at the net income figure of 75,000, but it's not a cash flow. So we're adding it back. We've also, when we look at our income statement, got a gain on the disposal of PP&E of 20,000. Now that's increased net income by 20,000, so we now need to deduct it. The other non-cash charge, and let's call these non-cash charges, non-cash charge, really to be on your guard for in the exam, is changes in deferred tax. Now let's look at our deferred taxes. They were 30,000 last year, they're 40,000 this year. That's a $10,000 increase in a liability. Now remember our mechanical rules, increase in a liability, we're going to add. So I'm gonna add that 10,000. We'll do it a little bit, uh, a little bit later. It will be added. Right, let's have a look at our current asset adjustments. First one is to start at the top of the income statement with our sales and say, well look, we're seeing a sales figure here of 200,000. That's not the same as cash. We then turn to the balance sheet and we look for any asset that relates to sales. Now the common one that we're gonna see is of course our accounts receivable that relates to cash balances uh, that have yet to be collected from the customers. Now we just look at the change, 18,000 last year, 20,000 this year, it's a $2,000 increase in an asset and therefore we deduct that increase. So that's why we've deducted the 2,000, being the difference between 20,000 at the year end, 18,000 at the start. That's converted essentially our sales into cash collected from customers. So we move to the next line in our income statement, which is our costs of goods sold. Now,
typically with cost of goods sold, there are going to be two adjustments to make. We're going to have to adjust number one for inventory and then number two for accounts payable. By adjusting from, for inventory, essentially we're moving from cost of goods sold to purchases. And then by adjusting for accounts payable, we're moving from purchases to cash paid to suppliers. So first of all, let's look at our inventory in the balance sheet. So when we turn to our inventory, 14,000 last year, 10,000 this year. It's a decrease in an asset, and a decrease in an asset is an inflow, so we're going to add that $4,000 decrease in inventory. That's essentially taking us from the cost of goods sold figure, uh, our cost of goods sold figure being 80,000, to our purchases figure. Now, we then move to our accounts payable. This will adjust us from purchases to cash paid to suppliers. So into the balance sheet, look at your liabilities, your current liabilities. Accounts payable have gone from $10,000 up to $18,000. An $8,000 increase in the liability. The rule is increases in liability we're going to add. So let's add that $8,000. OK, we've dealt with cost of goods sold. So we move down to the next line in our income statement, and that was salaries. Go into the balance sheet, look for any liability that relates to salaries. When I do that, I can see my salary is payable. 16,000 last year, 9,000 this year. That's a $7,000 decrease in the liability, and decreases in liabilities represent cash outflows. So I'm going to deduct my 7,000. I've dealt with my salaries now. Down to the next line. Depreciation, well, we've already dealt with depreciation up here in our non-cash charges. So keep moving down. Next line in your income statement is the interest expense of 1,000 into the balance sheet and look to see if you've got any interest liability. Yes, we have. We've got interest payable, 6000 last year, 7000 this year. A $1,000 increase, an increase, remember, in a liability we're going to add. And that takes us from the interest expense to the interest paid. Now we move then down to our final line in our income statement. And our final line in our income statement, well, actually we've got one extra line, that's the, the gain on uh, sale of PP&E. Remember, we deducted that as a non-cash charge up here. So then, after that, our final line is the provision for taxes. Two adjustments, essentially, to be made here. One for deferred tax, that non-cash charge that we mentioned up here, and one for any taxes payable. So, first of all, let's move in and look and see if we've got any taxes payable. When we do our taxes payable, yes, we do. It was 8,000 this year, 10,000 next year. $2,000 increase, in which case we've added it. The other element that affects uh, the tax provision in the income statement is changes in deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities. Now, when we look at our non-current liability, we can see that we've got deferred tax liabilities here. 30,000 last year, 40,000 this year, an increase of 10,000. So there you go, it's being an increase in a liability, it's going to be added. It's our final source of non-cash charges. So those are our non-cash charges, and these are the change in working capital, or the working capital investment, as we call it. And remember, we said net income plus non-cash charges minus the change in working capital gives us CFO. And that's essentially what we've just done here on a line-by-line -line basis. Now all we need to do is total this up and hopefully we get the cash flow from operations. So we've got a figure of 85,000. This is the cash that we generated from our day-to-day -day business activities. Now, CFO by definition is the hardest computation that we're likely to, to look at or be able to uh, need to describe in the exam. Calculating CFI is a little easier 
and we're going to see that calculating CFF is easier still. Now our cash flow from investing is going to be our investment in assets less any cash we receive on their disposal. Now remember, strictly speaking, when we look at our investments in assets, we're talking about the PP&E, we're talking about the intangibles, and we're talking about investments in group companies, as well as the passive investments available for sale and held for maturity. Reality is, in our exam, it's likely to just be PP&E, to keep things simple. So we need to see what has been spent on PP&E, and we need to see any cash received on the disposal of PP&E. Now, first of all, net book value. Net book value is the often referred to as carrying value. Remember, carrying value simply means balance sheet value. And it's the gross PP&E, in other words, the cost that we paid for our PP&E, minus the accumulated depreciation, the cumulative amount of depreciation that's been expensed to the income statement so far. Now, let's have a look at how the accountants compute the gain or loss on the asset sale in the income statement. Now, in our particular example, we saw that we got a gain of 20,000. How did they compute that? They look at the sales price, i.e. the proceeds, that you received minus the net book value, the balance sheet carrying value. So the gain or loss reported in the income statement is not purely cash. It's actually the cash we received when we sold the asset less the carrying value in the balance sheet. What that means essentially is if the proceeds are greater than the carrying value, you're going to see a gain in the income statement, which is what we've got in our example. Whereas if the proceeds essentially are less than the carrying value, you're going to see a loss on disposal reported in the income statement. So note, therefore, that the gain or loss on sale is not simply the proceeds, it's the proceeds minus the carrying value. OK, so let's have a look. We need to compute the carrying value of the asset that's been disposed of uh, for Eccleston. Now, we've been given the beginning uh, uh, PP&E uh, of 282000 That's the gross PP&E of 282000 and we've been given the ending PP&E of 312,000. Those are just lifted straight from the face of our balance sheet. Now the reconciliation, the difference will have to be this year's additions and this year's disposals. Now we're told the additions in this question, <coughs> we were told the equipment was purchased for $50,000. So we can add that. Now of course, what that means is if there were no disposals during the year, then 282 plus 50,000, i.e. 332, should have been the ending PP&E. But we haven't got 332,000. We've got 312,000. What must be the difference? Well, the difference must be the cost of the asset we disposed of. In other words, the cost of the asset disposed must have been 20,000. Now, again, let's have a look, essentially, at our accumulated depreciation and do the same thing. Accumulated depreciation was 80,000 at the start of the year, again, lifted straight from our balance sheet information. It was 84,000 at the end of the year. Now, each year, depreciation, accumulated depreciation, will rise by that year's depreciation expense. Do we know that year's depreciation expense? Yes, we can lift it straight from our income statement. So let's turn our attention back to the income statement and lift out our depreciation, that was 14,000. Now, of course, what that means is, if there was no asset disposal, 
the accumulated depreciation at the year end should have been 94,000. But it's not, it's only 84,000. The missing figure must be the accumulated depreciation on the asset we disposed of. So 10,000. So we now know we disposed of an asset that had a gross cost of 20,000 and accumulated depreciation of 10,000. So let's compute the net book value, the carrying value of the asset disposed of. 20 minus 10, okay, so 20 being the gross cost, our 10 being the accumulated depreciation, and that gives us a net book value of 10,000. Now that we've been armed with this, we can work out the proceeds received. Now, we've got, in this particular example, a gain on asset disposal of 20,000. We've lifted that 20,000 figure, there it is. We've lifted our 20,000 straight from our income statement. We know that the asset disposed of had a carrying value of 10,000. That's what we just computed on the last slide. So let's put that in. Now, what that tells us, essentially, is the sales proceeds must have been 30,000. 30 less 10, giving us our gain or loss, the accounting gain or loss of 20. So what we've just done is we've worked out the sale proceeds. Now, if you remember, our CFI is the additions and the proceeds, the additions being cash outflow, the proceeds on disposal being a cash inflow. We were told the additions was minus 50,000. We've just computed that the proceeds on disposal were 30,000. So overall, we've got a cash flow from investing of 20,000. Now we've done it for PP&E, but if you had intangibles in a question, it would be exactly the same treatment, only uh, of course you'd be dealing with amortization rather than depreciation. Now, that takes us to the last component of our cash flow statement, and that is cash flow from financing. The nice thing about this is this is going to be the easiest of the, the three, largely because we make some rather simplifying assumptions. So let's have a look at how we're going to compute it. We're going to take the change in debt. Now, this is simply the balance sheet change in debt. The balance sheet change in our interest-bearing debt instruments. We've got to be careful though, it's not just our long-term debt instruments, bonds and loans, we need to pick up on any interest-bearing uh, debt instruments sitting in current liabilities. The current portion of long-term debt and notes payable is what I want you to look out for. Changes in common stock, again we should be just able to pick this up by looking at the change in the contributed capital year to year. Now again, by looking at the change in the contributed capital, you're actually looking at the change in the common stock plus the change in any additional paid in capital during the year, the share premium. Cash dividends paid may be a little bit trickier. If we've just got a balance sheet or two balance sheets and an income statement, dividends don't show up. Remember, the only place we really see the dividends is in our statement of stockholders' equity, that reconciliation. So we might need to do a little bit of detective work. It's fairly easy to work out the dividends proposed though. Because if no dividends were proposed, then the change in this year's retained earnings should be equal to that year's net income. So we can work out the dividends declared if that's not the case. Look at the change in retained earnings year to year, and if that is smaller than that year's net income, then the missing figure, if you like, must be our dividends declared. So compare net income to the change in balance sheet retained earnings, and that gives you your dividends. Now there's one final complication. Dividends declared aren't the same as the cash paid by way of a dividend. Typically dividends are declared at the year end, but they're not paid until after the year end. So we're going to need to make an adjustment as well. Put in your dividends declared, and I'm putting it in as a negative figure because essentially it reduces retained earnings. That's why I put it in the bracket here. Then go into your balance sheet and look for any dividend payable liability. Now notice, when we were doing our CFO, we dealt with accounts payable, salaries payable, interest payable, tax payable. The one current liability that we didn't touch was dividends payable. And that's because dividends payable is a cash flow from financing, not a cash flow from operations. Now when we look at our dividends payable, it was 2,000, it's gone up to 12,000. And we're going to use the same mechanics that we, we used, an increase in a liability we're going to be adding, and a decrease in a liability we'll be subtracting. So let's have a look at our CFF then for Eccleston. First of all, the change in debt, quick review of current liabilities, 
Can I see notes payable? Can I see current portion of long-term debt? No, nothing in there. So we don't have any uh, short-term debt instruments in this qu question. Look at the non-current liabilities. It was 20,000, it's now 30,000. We're gonna take that $10,000 increase to be an increase in cash. So there it is, 10,000, the difference between 20,000 last year, 30,000 this year. Now in practice, that is a simplification due to the amortization of premiums and discounts on bonds issued. We're gonna sweep that complication under the carpet. For our exam, all you're gonna do is look at the change in the balance sheet debt. In other words, our examiner makes a simplification and assumes that debt was issued at par value, so there is no amortization of premiums and discounts. Let's look at our change in com and stock. Now we've got our contributed capital of 100,000 last year, 80,000 this year. So we're gonna just assume that the difference, the 20,000, was a share buyback. Okay, so a cash outflow due to share buybacks. Then the final thing we're gonna to need to do here is to compute our cash dividends paid. Little bit of detective work, first of all, to work out the dividend declared. Net income from our income statement was 75,000, but when we look at our retained earnings, they've only changed by 58,000. Therefore, the difference between 75,000 and 58,000 must be the dividend declared 17,000. Okay, now again, another complication. If you've got a dividend payable liability in current liabilities, then the dividend declared isn't the same as the cash paid. So we need to make an adjustment. So there's my dividend declared in brackets to indicate it's a negative figure. Must do that, otherwise you're adding and subtracting rules are gonna go a little bit haywire. So dividends declared negative figure, reducing retained earnings in, the, uh, in equity. We then go into the balance sheet looking for any dividend payable. There it is, 2,000 up uh, to 12,000. So a $10,000 increase, increase in a liability add. So we're gonna add that, 10,000. And that of course means the cash that we actually paid must have been 7,000, the cash outflow to our shareholders, 7,000 during the year. Let's complete our CFF calculation then. Cash dividend paid 7,000. Let's total it up. Inflow of 10,000, outflow of 20,000 and 7,000. So therefore, net outflow of 17,000. Okay, we've computed CFO, we've computed CFI, we've computed CFF. Let's put it all together in, a, in, a, in the cash flow statement and see what we end up with. So here you go, those are our three elements. CFO, 85,000. CFI, outflow 20,000. And CFF, outflow 17,000. That gives us a net increase in cash of 48,000. Now, that's good news. Because if you remember, if we take last year's cash balance, 18,000 in the balance sheet, and this year's cash balance, 66,000, you can see that 48,000 is the difference. So in other words, the opening cash balance, 18,000, plus the change in cash, 48,000, gives us our closing cash of 66,000. So we can be fairly confident in this case that we've actually correctly computed the cash flow. Now, our next little LOS asks us to convert cash flows from the indirect to the direct method. Now remember, the accounting standards actually say the direct method is preferable because essentially there's more information provided uh, to stakeholders there. They can see how CFO was actually generated. But we said actually a lot of companies will choose to use the indirect method that we've just performed because essentially it's a lot quicker process uh, in, in calculation, calculating. So what we're asked to do therefore is convert. We're essentially going to reproduce the direct method for a company that's only given us the indirect method because we want more information on the sources and uses of cash flow from operation. Okay, so look, they're giving you examples here. If we wanted to calculate cash collections from our customer, take the sales figure, deduct the change in accounts receivable, and add on any advances from customers. This is our deferred uh, deferred revenues that we've been talking about before when customers pay you in advance. I have to say, I think there's a, a very, very slim chance of seeing that within a question, but nonetheless, it could be there. Now, all we're really doing is what we did with our T account there. We're taking the change in accounts receivable, the opening and closing amounts, the difference. 
we're saying, well, okay, look, let's, if that's gone up, an increase in an asset, we're going to deduct it. If it's gone down, we're going to add it, compare it to the sales figure. And then we're doing the same for any liability that relates to sales being our deferred income. Look with our cost of goods sold as well. Uh, essentially, we're taking the cost of goods sold. We're subtracting the change in inventory. That takes us from cost of goods sold to purchases. And then, of course, we're adding the accounts payable that takes us, or the change in accounts payable, I should say, that takes us from purchases to cash paid to suppliers. So the thing to notice here is essentially we're doing the same as the indirect method. Essentially, we're taking a balance sheet figure and adjusting it, uh, or we're taking an income statement figure and adjusting it um, for the, the balance sheet change. With the indirect method, we started at net income, so we already had all the income statement data, and therefore we just needed to add back non-cash charges and adjust for the working capital items. This approach, the direct method, we're doing it on a line-by-line -line basis rather than starting with net income. Okay, so what we're going to do is take each income statement item in turn, starting with the top of the income statement and working down to the bottom. So we're going to start with sales. If it's a revenue, we're going to include it as a positive figure. If it's an expense, we're going to include it as a negative figure. Otherwise, our adding and subtracting rules are not going to work. So we take each income statement in turn. We start off with sales. We then go into the balance sheet and look for any asset or liability that relates to sales. Now, of course, typically it will be an asset, accounts receivable. Could also see a liability if we've got some uh, deferred income as well. Unlikely, as I said in the example, you never know. Okay, now, once we've identified the balance sheet asset or liability, then what we need to do is look at the change in the balance sheet asset or liability, just like we did under the indirect method. And of course, change, very simple. We're just going to look at the ending balance minus the opening balance. Then we're going to apply the rule, and it's the same rule that we used under the under the uh, indirect method. In other words, an increase in an asset we're going to deduct, a decrease in an asset we're going to add. An increase in a liability we're going to add, a de decrease in a liability deduct. Exactly the same mechanical rules, wrote, learn it, exactly the same mechanical rules as the indirect method. So what we then do is we take our income statement item and adjust it for the change in the balance sheet amounts to get the cash flow. We tick the item off, dealt with in the income statement, dealt with in the balance sheet, and we move down the income statement to the next line. Now, as we go down, sooner or later, we're going to hit some of our non-cash items, in particular, depreciation, gains and losses on asset disposals. Now, under the indirect method, we added those back. We added, added back depreciation to remove it. But that's because we started at net income, and net income had already deducted depreciation. Here, we're not starting at net income, so we've never deducted it. So rather than adding it back, we can simply ignore it. So when you come across non-cash charges, under the direct method, simply ignore them. So we're going to ignore depreciation, amortization, we ignore gains and losses on disposal of assets, ignore gains and losses on the early retirement of debt, etc. So we keep moving down the income statement until we hit our net income line, we then total it up and we should get CFO. And it should be completely consistent with the CFO figure that we calculated under the indirect method. So let us have a look, therefore, at Eccleston Industries. So let's start off with this. Our sales figure lifted straight from the income statement, so that's 200,000. We then move into the balance sheet and adjust for the accounts receivable. Now, the accounts receivable, remember, in our balance sheet, 18,000 last year, 20,000 this year, $2,000 increase, deduct that increase, Okay, and we get 198,000, which must be the cash that we collected from our customers. Let's now turn to our uh, next line in our income statement, which is our cost of goods sold of 80,000. So there it is, 80,000. Note we put it in a bracket to indicate it's an expense, a negative value. Cost of goods sold, always two adjustments to be made. First of all, it's going to be inventory, then it's going to be accounts payable. Okay, so let's have a quick look, therefore, um, at inventory, current asset, our inventory, 14,000 last year, 10,000 this year, a decrease in a current asset of $4,000, decreases in assets, we're going to add. So take your negative 80,000, add 4,000, we're now at 76,000. 
That represents the purchases figure. What a, why does it represent the purchases figure? Well, let's think about cost of goods sold. It's actually made up of beginning inventory plus our purchases, less our ending inventory. And that gives us our cost of goods sold. So essentially what we're doing by taking cost of goods sold and essentially adjusting for the change in inventory is we're eliminating that and that and we're left with purchases. That's why we've got a purchase figure of 76,000. Now, once we've got the purchases figure, we've then got to adjust for accounts payable. We may have purchased these goods, but we may not have paid for them at the year end date. So into the balance sheet, check out your current liabilities. There's our accounts payable was 10,000, now 8,000, increase in the liability add. So 8,000 we're gonna add, and we get the cash paid to suppliers of 68,000. Okay, so lovely. So we've dealt with, um, we've dealt with essentially the sales, we've dealt with the cost of goods sold. Of course, when we come across the non-cash items like depreciation, like amortization, under the direct method, we simply ignore them. So we can ignore our depreciation in this case. So we keep on moving down to the next non-cash, uh, sorry, the next cash element, and that's our operating expenses. In this case, we've got some wages in there. So we've got a wage expense of 10,000, put that in. It's an expense, I put it in brackets to indicate it's negative. Then into the balance sheet to look for any asset liability relating to wages. We've got salaries payable, 16,000 this uh, last year, 9,000 this year, a decrease of 7,000, a decrease, of course, we're gonna deduct. Meaning, decrease of 7,000, taking us to cash paid of 17,000 to our employees. Keep moving down, we get to our interest expense, uh, interest expense in the income statement 1,000, into the balance sheet, look for any change in interest payable liability, Interest payable was 6,000, it's now 7,000, $1,000 increase, increase on a liability add. So actually you'll notice therefore that this year's interest expense, none of it has been paid out by way of a cash. We've got a zero figure. We then get to the gain or loss on our asset disposals. We don't need to worry about these. Number one, it's not cash. And number two, a disposal of an asset would be a cash flow from investing. Either way you want to think about it, you want to be leaving it out. So move down now to the last uh, item, which is our tax expense. Now again, two adjustments that you're going to need to make to the tax expense. First of all, for deferred taxes. Now again, always be on your lookout for these. We have got deferred taxes. It was 30,000 last year, 40,000 this year, an increase of 10,000 increase in the liability we're going to add. So we take the 40,000 provision from the income statement, add the 10,000, and that gives us tax payable. Now tax payable is essentially the amount we think we owe to the tax authorities based on this year's profits. Once we've got tax payable, we then just need to look at if there's any tax payable liabilities. We may owe the tax authorities 30,000, doesn't mean we paid them 30,000. So we then move in and look at any liabilities. Tax payable liability, 8,000 last year, 10,000 this year, an increase of 2,000, add that increase, and we get the cash tax paid of 28,000. We're now at the bottom of our income statement. All we need to do is add it up. So there's the cash collected from our customers, 198,000, cash paid to suppliers, 68,000, cash paid to employees, 17, cash interest paid, nothing, Cash taxes paid 28, and hey, there's the 85,000. Note exactly the same figure that we achieved when we used the indirect method. Now, do I expect you to have found that particularly easy? No. I really think cash flow statements, both indirect method, but particularly the direct method, and note the LOS says convert, so it's certainly focusing on, on doing calculations. It's a tricky area. Now, after a while, it becomes very mechanical. It's very, uh, all questions become very similar. So I always know costs are goods sold, or I'm looking for two things, the change in inventory, the changes in account payable. But at first, it is not automatic, and it does take some time. Best thing you can be doing in this area, in fact, really, the best thing you can do with your home studies full stop 
is practice a lot of questions, hit a lot of questions, drill questions until this process becomes automatic. Right, we then turn on to maybe a, a, some happier LOSs or maybe at least some simpler learning outcome statements here. And what we're actually going to look at is cash flow statement analysis. We need to analyze both reported cash flow statements and common size cash flow statements. Now, of course, what kind of questions is the analyst asking? Most important, of course, is to look at the CFO because this is the cash that the company is generating from its day-to-day -day trading activities. So the first question is, is the CFO enough to sustain the business? Is it bigger than CFI and CFO outflows, for example? So that's the next question. If you've got the debt that's maturing, are the cash flows from operations sufficient to pay off those principal elements? Or are we going to need to raise additional finance? Likewise, when we look at the cash flow statement, we're seeing flexibility. Cash balances give the firm the ability to deal with the unexpected. Unexpected in terms of downturns, of course, but also unexpected in terms of investment opportunities. So we want to analyze the major sources and uses of cash flow. In particular, as I said, CFO being the most important because this is a sustainable cash that the company is actually generating from its core business activities. So look at the major sources and uses. If you had negative cash flow from operations, but positive cash flow from financing, keeping cash overall positive, that would be a big warning sign. Hey, look, this company isn't generating cash flows from its day-to-day -day activities. It's reliant, essentially, on continuing borrowing. So certainly, look at the major sources and uses. Is CFO positive? I think that's the number one question to ask ourselves. Is it positive? Is it enough to cover your capital expenditure? So is it bigger than CFI? If it's not, then we know in order to keep our capital expenditure up, we're going to need to borrow more. So I'm particularly interested in, does CFO cover CapEx and does CFO cover any debt repayments? Next thing, analyze your CFO. What are the major determinants? Where is the CFO being generated from? How much is being generated from this, your customers? How much is being paid to suppliers, etc.? Now this question here is a a point that the examiner is very keen on. Keen on it at level one, but all over it in the level two syllabus. And it's comparing cash flow from operations to net income. Now, the idea is the closer these two figures are, the more quality your earnings are, the better quality your net income. What we're particularly worried about is seeing positive net income, but it's not backed by cash flows. Net income, if you like, is generated from two sources. It's generated from cash-based transactions, but also the accruals process. If net income is much higher than CFO, it's indicating a lot of our earnings are coming from the accruals process, which by definition is unsustainable. What we tend to find is any accruals will reverse in the future. So we want CFO to be very close to net income to get a nice feeling that our net income is sustainable long run. How consistent is CFO is simply looking at the variability of your cash flow from operations over time. Okay, when we're looking at CFI, cash flow from investing, what you need to see here is what is it being spent on? Is it being spent on PP&E? If it is, that's an indication that the firm is investing in infrastructure. Is that consistent with the management discussion and analysis? Is it consistent with competitors? Does it look like the market is expanding for this company's products? Of course, it might not be spent on PP&E. It might be spent on acquisitions of um, subsidiaries or associates. Now, again, that's giving us an idea. Are they going for organic growth, in which case they're investing in PP&E, or are they going for merger and acquisition-led growth, in which case we'll be seeing uh, acquiring, uh, them acquiring subsidiaries and outflows due to that? So nice, you can get an idea of the strategy and compare it to what's actually happening or what's being discussed in the management discussion and analysis. CFF, well, cash flow from financing. How is the company financing its cash flow from investments and cash flow from operations? Is the company raising or repaying capital? So in particular, uh, is the CFI positive? Sorry, CFF positive, in which case, essentially, they're raising cash. Is it negative and outflow, in which case they're essentially paying off? So we're interested, essentially, in are they raising or 
uh, paying down their capital. We'd be interested in the component split. Is it equity that's being raised or repaid? Is it essentially debt uh, that's being raised or repaid? And if there are repayments, of course, of debt, we'd be interested in comparing them to our CFO to look at how comfortably we're meeting those principal payments. Other thing to ask ourselves as well is the dividends. Compare the dividends maybe to cash flow to look at how sustainable that dividend is, how comfortably we're meeting, meeting that dividend from our cash flows. Common size cash flow statements, not a lot really to say about these other than there are the two approaches. One, you can show each item in the cash flow statement as a percentage of sales. The alternative approach is you show each cash inflow as a percentage of total inflows, each cash outflow as a percentage of total outflows. Again, idea is we're converting an absolute monetary statement into percentages and therefore a relative statement that can be compared between companies of different size. And again, we can use trend analysis, looking at one company and how the percentages change over time, or cross-sectional analysis, comparing between competitors. Now notice another thing, uh, we can use it maybe for forecasting future cash flows. If we're looking at every element of the cash flow statement as a percentage of sales, then if we forecast next year's sales, we should be able to forecast next year's cash flow. Now I've actually done uh, this for our uh, Eccleston example. I've looked at the inflows as a percentage of total inflows. So notice we can see the vast majority of inflows to this company are coming from receipts to their custom, from their customers, which is good because we'd assume that that's relatively sustainable. You can see 12.6% of inflows came from disposal of equipment. Now again, this of course is far less sustainable. You can't continually sell off your infrastructure, otherwise soon the firm won't be able to operate. But it's only 12.6%. So again, you'd need to compare it with your competitors. Does that look reasonable or not? And then debt issuance, 4.2% of our total cash inflows come from debt issuance. Again, the bigger this figure is here, maybe the less sustainable it is. You can't endlessly borrow debt. Your leverage is going to increase. Your credit rating is going to decline until, of course, you can't raise any more finance. Let's have a look at our outflows. So payments to suppliers, 35.8% of total outflows. Uh, payments to employees, 8.9%. Again, are these good, are these bad? Who knows? Maybe a bit of cross-sectional analysis to compare to our competitors. Maybe a bit of trend analysis over time to see are they increasing, are they decreasing over time. Okay, so again, just looking in isolation is not going to tell you a little, uh, a lot here. You can see that 26.3% of our cash outflows were due to purchases of equipment. So you can see that some capex essentially is going on here. Right, our next LOS is asking us to be able to calculate free cash flows. Now there are two free cash flows that we need to be able to calculate. Free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow to equity. Now, we're also asked to interpret, so we better interpret what a free cash flow is. Now, free cash, we're saying, is available for discretionary uses. This is the cash that the firm could distribute after meeting capital expenditure requirements. So we're assuming that capex is a non-discretionary item here. Now, as we said, we've got two measures. Free cash flow to the firm is the free cash flows available to distribute to both debt and equity holders. And free cash flow to equity is the free cash flows available to distribute purely to the equity holders. So we often refer to free cash flow to the firm as an unleveraged measure because it's before any distributions to either the debt or equity holders. Free cash flow to equity is often referred to as a post-levered measure because it's after distributions to the debt holders. But of course, crucially before distributions to the equity holders. So let's have a look. So we're going to take our net income, add back our non-cash charges and subtract our working capital. Well, this really up here in our bracket is just saying, use the indirect method to adjust from net income to cash flow from operations. Now, once we've got CFO, there's a little bit of a problem with CFO if you want to calculate free cash flow to the firm. And it's because free cash flow to the firm is before any distributions to both debt and equity holders. Trouble is, cash flow from operations is before distributions to the equity holders, i.e. dividends, 
but it's after distributions to the debt holders. It's after interest payments. So what we're going to need to do is ba add back interest payments. We want a pre-levered measure before interest payments. So we're adding back the interest. Now, again, if you add back the interest, it's only fair that you lose the tax yield. Remember, interest is tax deductible and therefore saves you tax. So if we want to know what the cash flow was before interest payments, we need to add back the interest, but we also need to lose the tax yield. And that's why we're taking the interest expense and multiplying by 1 minus t, where t is the firm's tax rate. So we're adding back net interest. So CFO plus net interest, that now gives us a pre-levered measure of cash flow from operations. Now remember the CFA Institute's definition of free cash flow is it's after all capex. Now definitions between different analysts vary. When I worked in corporate finance, we used to just look at the capex required to replace the wearing out of existing PP&E and any additional capex we deem to be discretionary. Here, CFA Institute include all capex. So we're going to deduct the fixed capital investment. Now again, for our exam, our fixed capital investment is essentially our CFI figure. Okay, now let's have a look at free cash flow to equity. It's a post-levered measure. So again, we start off with CFO. It's after interest payments have been deducted, but that's fine because it's a post-levered measure. So we don't need to add back the net interest. What we do need to do is subtract the fixed capital investment, the capex, and what we do need to do is increase or add the net debt increase. Now be careful with the definition of net debt here. Here, it's simply the balance sheet change in debt. Okay, I know some people use net debt when they talk about net debt. They talk about debt, uh, less uh, cash and investments, essentially. Not our definition here. It's simply the balance sheet change in debt. Again, be a little bit careful uh, because therefore it's, it includes both short-term, current liability debt instruments and long-term. Argument being is you could essentially raise some debt and immediately distribute it to your equity holders. Remember, free cash flow to equity is after all uh, payments and receipts to the debt holders. So it's after interest payments and it's after issuing new debt and redeeming debt. In other words, principal flows. Okay, so let's have a look at it for our company, Eccleston. We know our CFO, we calculated that to be 85,000. I'm gonna take the interest expense, $1,000, times the firm's tax rate of 40%. So that's essentially a $600, uh, if you like, saving there. And then I'm gonna subtract my free cash flow, uh, sorry, my cash flow from investing, C uh, CFI, of 20,000. So CFO plus the net interest minus our fixed capital investment, our CFI, giving me 65,600. Okay, that's free cash flow to firm. Uh, that's the cash flows available to distribute to both debt and equity holders. Let's look at free cash flow to equity. This is after the payments and receipts to the debt holders. So we start off with the 85,000. No need to add back the net, uh, the net interest. All we're gonna do is deduct the fixed capital investment and add on the net debt increase. Now, if you remember when we looked at our uh, balance sheet earlier, we saw the change in balance sheet debt. I think we only had bonds and it was an increase of 10,000. So notice that gives us 75,000. Now you should be able to reconcile between the two. Notice the only difference between the two measures are the payments and receipts to the debt holders. In other words, the only differences are free cash flow is added back net interest and free cash, free cash flow to the firm, I should say, is added back net interest free cash flow to equity is added back the net debt increase. So if we're starting with free cash flow to the firm, to reconcile to free cash flow to equity, all we're gonna to need to do is subtract the net interest and add the net debt increase. So we're gonna to have to, let's do it actually. There you go. So starting with our free cash flow to the firm, our 56, sorry, 60, 65,600, subtract the net interest that was added, the 600, and then add on the net debt increase, and we arrive at our free cash flow to equity. So remember, therefore, free cash flow is the discretionary cash that could be distributed um, to the providers of finance, free cash flow to the firm, both debt and equity holders, free cash flow to equity, only equity holders, without affecting the growth potential of the company. 
So after we've made our capital expenditure. Okay, our next little LOS is calculate uh, the ratios. Um, so we've got some cash flow ratios based here. Cash flow to revenue, well, if you think about it, it's very similar to net profit margin. When we look at net profit margin, we compare net income to sales. Now, of course, another name for sales is simply net revenue. Here, all we're doing is replacing net income with CFO. So it's a cash-based measure of, if you like, the net profit margin. Cash flow return on assets. Well, again, our return on assets traditionally, ROA, is calculated as net income over average total assets. So what we're looking at here is a cash-based measure of return on assets. Rather than using net income on our numerator, we're using cash flow from operations. Same with cash return on equity. Well, our traditional return on equity calculation is net income over average equity. And when we say equity, we're talking about the balance sheet stockholders' uh, funds. So this is a cash-based measure of ROE. Cash to income, CFO, over here, this is really our EBIT, operating income. And now again, the problem is operating income strictly is just the cash flows or the profits or the earnings from our operating activities, excluding any non-operating activities. Problem that we have is there's no measure of that on the, the face of the income statement. So often what we end up doing is using EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, as a proxy to uh, operating income. But be aware, they're not strictly exactly the same. Now again, this is trying to give us an idea of the quality of our operating income. We want uh, the operating income, if you like, to be smaller than the cash flow from operations or to be similar from cash flow from operations. Issue being, if your operating income is far bigger than cash flow from operations, it's therefore telling you that a lot of your earnings in the income statement are being generated purely from the accruals process and are not backed by cash. And again, it comes back to this rule, earnings not backed by cash are unsustainable in the long run. Cash flow per share, well, this is really just a reworking of basic earnings per share. Now, of course, with basic earnings per share, we do, took net income, subtracted any preference dividends to get earnings attributable to the common stockholders, and then divided by the weighted average number of common shares in issue. Here, all we're doing is replacing net income with CFO. So it's a cash-based measure of earnings per share. Note it's saying, under IFRS, dividends could be treated as a CFO, dividends paid as a CFO. Remember, under US GAAP, they're always a CFF. In that situation, you would actually have to add back the dividend paid to the common stockholders as well on your numerator. So it would be CFO plus dividend to common stockholders minus preference dividend. Debt coverage, CFO compared to total debt. I guess really what you're saying is if CFO was used to pay off principal, what proportion of my debt could I repay? So again, it's looking at it's a kind of leverage uh, measure. Interest coverage, well look, CFO, add back interest and tax over interest paid. Now typically when we look at interest coverage, we compare EBIT, earnings before interest and tax, over interest. And it's a safety ratio. It's looking at how comfortably we're making, meeting our interest payments. So what we're simply doing is looking at the cash-based version of EBIT on our numerator. It's a safety ratio. How comfortably are we meeting our interest payments out of our cash flows available? Reinvestment, CFO over cash paid for our long-term assets. So again, typically at level one, that will just be our cash flow from investing. Again, you want CFO to be bigger than cash flow from investing, indicating that it's sustainable in the long run. Debt repayment, CFO over cash paid for long-term debt repayment. In other words, we're looking at our principal payments here. And again, it's a safety ratio. How comfortably are we meeting our principal payments out of our current cash flow from operations? 
Dividend payment, yet another safety ratio, CFO over dividends paid. How comfortable is the dividend payment? Again, you want the dividends to be substantially smaller than the CFO, indicating that they're sustainable for our company. And then finally, CFO over both CFI plus CFF. Again, overall, you want CFO to be higher than CFI, CFF, because again, it's a safety ratio. It's, in, it's meaning that you're comfortably covering your investing and financing out of your cash flows that, from operations, your day-to-day -day cash that you're generating from your trading activities. 